Welcome back to the Shop Mini RC, everybody. I'm Ken, and today we are looking at the new Red Cat Ascent 118. Uh, this little thing is going to be awesome. Uh, we've seen a lot about it already. We picked up the red. Where's it at? Does it show it? It doesn't show what it's marked as. Either way, we picked up the red, which is going to look like this, because, well, you know, channel colors and all, got to represent. Oh, there it is, right there, yeah. Uh, so that's going to be super cool. I can't wait to get this thing open. We're going to deep dive this thing. We're going to open it up, show you what's inside, not only the box, but inside that truck itself, inside the axles, inside the transmission. We're going to open it all up and, um, yeah, make sure there's bearings in there. It says bearings up here, so we trust them, but we're going to show you anyway. Make sure it's greased up, right, and uh, just give you kind of a little breakdown. Let's go. Now, before we get too deep, make sure you guys like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell if you guys want to support the channel. We really appreciate it. Um, it just helps with the algorithms when you hit that like button. And uh, if you like the video, it's worth sharing, right? If you don't like the video, make sure you hit that thumbs down button two times. That way you show us just how much you dislike this video. Actually, before we open this up, let me just show you all the sides. There you go, you can pause, you can look, you can read. Bam, bam. We include the, uh, the brush crawler, the radio, the light boat, battery charger. All you need is some triple A's. Clipless body mount, battery and charger included, 750 LiPo, 4KG metal gear servo, three different colors to choose from, boom, boom, boom. All right, now we can open her up. Bam, just sitting there right on top. Ooh, buddy. Are we, are we strapped in? I think we might be strapped in. This guy right here, we gotta cut that. Get out of here. Boom. Oh, I love these wheels. Those are super cool looking. Man, that red looks so good. Looks so good. More stuff in the box. And that's it. We destroyed that box. Just the inside. Our very familiar FlySky remote. We'll see if this can bind to other stuff. Hopefully it's using the same protocol. I assume it is. Got our uh, little instruction pamphlet. Is this a manual or a pamphlet? I don't know, let's look. Oh, get open. Looking more like a uh, single sheet pamphlet. Basic start stuff. If you want to go deeper, here you go. Full manual is online. Go ahead and scan that guy. Give you a deeper look into the truck. And then we got our USB charger. I'm not the biggest fan of these, but again, if this is your first ever truck, you're gonna need something to charge your truck with, so these are good to go. But I'd highly recommend your first upgrade being a hobby grade charger. We have a couple videos on those. You can check them out right over there. A single port charger and a dual port charger. All right, looks like we got some body posts and some other little goodies in there. I'm digging that. And then some stickers. So you can put your numbers on there. Nice little blackouts for the fenders, so you can black out your fenders if you want. I love it. Great little sticker sheet. What is that? I don't even know what that's for. Oh, those are little flags, I guess? Tell me what this what this is in the comments below, guys. I don't know. What is that? What does that represent? Is that a red cat thing? Is that a, a crawler thing I'm unaware of? A racing thing I'm unaware of? Here's some sponsors. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. And bam, there she is. Just give you a real good look here. That red is so good, guys. It is so good. Hold on, her front's already popped off. Oh, I see how it goes on there. Okay. So on the bottom here, you've got a little twisty lock. And then that lets this hinge right up. So you can hinge it and get in there quickly and easily for your battery without having to take the whole body off. And if you want to take the whole body off, you just drop it back down and slide it forward. You can see it's got this sort of a latch on there and sort of a round thing. I, I definitely dig that uh, design for a body latch system. 
I, I, I hate body clips. I hate body clips. So this, this little guy is pretty, pretty slick to be able to get that on there easily. Let's see, and then we just turn it. Yeah, there she goes. Just turns. Boom. Look at our approach angle, guys. Oof. It's almost more than 90 degrees. Hold on. Do we have something flat? Let's get something flat. Oh, you might have like a millimeter. Oh, no, I don't know. It might be totally 90 degrees. We're kind of banging on our bumper before we bang on the tires. Let's see. Same here. Bumper's hitting before the tires, so. Like, what is that? Maybe 89 degrees? <laughs> Either way, you want your bumper extending past your tires for certain comp rule regulations. So hopefully, if we have, we'd have to actually get down there and look on something exactly 90 degrees to make sure that our bumpers extend first. They do look like it though, just barely though, like a millimeter. If you put bigger tires on, you're definitely going to be past your bumpers. I love all the detail though. Looks good. Uh, it's a semi-transparent windshield. I wish it was a little bit more transparent, just a little bit. I mean, you can barely see through it. It'd be nice to be a little more transparent. I know what they're trying to do, though. You're trying to, you want to hide the insides of the truck because there's no interior. But if we throw an interior in there, now all of a sudden you can't see it at all. That's okay, though. Um, this rear latch is basically part of this rear plastic piece right here. So that's all part of that mount. And then our front, it looks like the screws for the front. Yeah, I think this is a, I think they're right behind the sticker. I think this is a thicker sticker here, but I think our screws go right through in there. So it looks like the screw heads go this way. So I don't know what they're screwing into. Maybe there's a nut on the other side. It's like a screw with a little tiny nut, but then it's hidden by our sticker. Don't really want to peel this off, but I kind of want to know. You know what? As long as we don't damage it. We can always re-glue it. Oh, there you go. There you go. Nobody else showed this, so I wanted to show it. So it looks like there's a little plastic recessed bit, and uh, you screw into that little plastic bit. It probably has two little uh, tubes that can drop into this mount, and then the screw goes into that. So there you go. Now you know. I dig this style body. It's. Um, I wish. I kind of wish the fenders were a little different. I don't know. This is kind of kind of goofy. Kind of. I don't know. It's going to take some growing, I think, but. I love the overall body, the like shape, very cool. This front grille kind of reminds me of like a Corvair, a Corvair truck. Kind of, anybody know what that is? Not a Corvette, a Corvair, Chevy Corvair. Actually, fun fact, my very first car when I was 14 years old, I was babysitting for this family. I was a babysitter and um, they had like six different Corvairs and they had one that he was just kind of done with. And he's like, you know what? I'll sell you this car for when you get your license. He sold me a 1964 yellow, canary yellow Corvair. And I drove the car a little bit with no license just around the neighborhood. And then my buddy got his license first. And so I was like, let me sell you the car. So I went ahead and sold him the car for more than I paid for it because I got a killer deal on it. But it wasn't even the point. It was more so that he could drive it and we could drive around and something. Literally the next weekend, before I even got a ride in it with him, he wrapped it around a tree. Because the motor's in the back on those cars, he hit a tree straight on and it just, whoosh, tree goes all the way up into the windshield. Ugh, he was fine. But like, if I knew he was going to total that car, I never would have sold it to him. All right, anyway, story time with the shop. Yeah, so here we go. I mean, this thing's uh, really well laid out. Forward bias on the motor. The one thing I would change, you know, if we're going to do some comp stuff straight out of the box, is I would remove the battery tray and this battery, and I would put, uh, if I could, if there's room up front, I'd put the battery up here for like a small comp battery, like one of these guys, right? Boom. I bet you that fits just fine. Yeah. So there you go. If you're going to comp it, that's all I would do. Remove the battery, remove the tray, and get a small 2S or maybe even 3S. This guy should be able to run on 3S. Um, although if you run it on 3S and you fry it, they say 2S only, but I've seen some people running it on 3S. So fry it. It's uh, not Red Cat's fault. You did it to yourself, but it seems okay. We'll probably run it on 3S and uh, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, definitely can fit a small, what is this? A little uh, 180, 180 milliamp, and it fits just fine down in there. And then we usually will just put a rubber band. We'll, we'll unscrew the tray, put a little rubber band around that, and uh, drop this guy right on there. But if you're going trailing, this is where it's at. This comes with the biggest 
RTR battery that I have seen for these little guys. Come on, Velcro. A750, guys. That's a huge battery for these little guys. You're going to be trailing for hours. <laughs> like, it's just, this is awesome. So I love that it comes with a big battery um, because most of the people that comp usually have their own small batteries. So awesome to come with that for the new guys or if you want to just go trailing. Um, nice looking oil-filled shocks here. They are plastic. We'll open these up later. Um, there's our servo. Looks like an Emacs almost. So that's going to be decent. We can swap it out straight over to an Emacs or a larger servo. One thing I notice here already, the links kind of come up. The front upper links are raised just a little bit behind the servo. So if we stick a uh, high torque aftermarket metal case servo, it's going to probably be angled or you're going to have to mount it raised up a little bit just because these links, man, I, I wish people would not, I wish companies would mount their links below the servo. I know it's hard. They're trying to get that servo as low as they can, but, or you're going to have to use a smaller servo, right? A small, uh, less long servo. The servo is kind of short, so you need to use a short servo, but like the uh, Reefs 99s, the NSD RC, RS 100s, OGRCs, I think even the Ajora 11 kg or 13 kg or whatever it is, there's two different ones. They're all longer, so they're going to have issues there. You might have to, again, angle it, uh, but that also means you're rubbing on your links. So I don't know. We'll have to have some solutions there. I'm sure somebody will come out with an aftermarket servo tray here to lift it up a little bit, but then you end up hitting, uh, so you lose some of your compression. But it is what it is. There's always trade-offs. These cool little boat sliders. We're going to pull all these stickers off here. Um, I dig that these boat sliders do drop off so you can run it without this like uh, triangulated slider and just have it with the top slider piece. So that's cool. There's two screws here. We'll show that later. Um, what else we got? We're on portal axles, obviously. Receiver two in one uh, ESC receiver combo in the back. Uh, no lights on this guy, right? No, no lights. Yeah, I dig the low profile bumpers. This is definitely designed to be like a very entry level class one type truck. This is gonna be great for class one. As long as you don't go bigger on your tires. What size are these tires? Let's look here. Does it say? It doesn't say what size the tires are. I believe the website states that they are 60 millimeters. We'll just go ahead and give a measure here. Yeah, right there at 60, 61. I mean, if I go down to 60, we start to uh, grab. So I think they're close, probably closer to 61 millimeter. Uh, so depending on your class rules, you might have to put some smaller tires on there. I think some class ones max out at 57 millimeter, but then you'll definitely have clearance. Uh, you know, your front bumper overhangs and, and all that kind of stuff uh, should be totally good there. These are glued on. Unfortunately, I really like these wheels. They are plastic, but like I would almost keep these wheels, maybe sharpie them up with some silver chrome sharpie pen on the lugs and it would look fantastic, but they are glue ons. So that sucks. These tires do feel really good though. The compound. You can hear it. Very sticky feeling. So we'll see how those do straight out the box. Um, yeah. While we're doing the overview, let me just hit those bullet points one more time. It's full ball bearings everywhere, which is great uh, for less resistance, smoother operation. Uh, basically give you better wheel speed, better control. It's better precision. Does mean if you go in the water with it, however, just make sure you're not going to rust. Make sure you dry it out, oil up your bearings, stuff like that. It's all hex hardware. Everywhere is hex har hardware. Um, Again, the servo is a metal geared servo, so that's awesome. Four kilogram metal gear servo. Uh, it's called a Hexify. You can see it on there. Hexfly, Hexfly, not Hexify, excuse me. Hexfly HXM4K, four kilogram coreless metal servo. So that's cool. Aluminum chassis rails, right? Got the aluminum chassis rails here. Uh, it's on portal axles, obviously, which means it's also got, uh, it's gonna be gearing down, which means you're gonna have tons of torque, but we should also still have some pretty good wheel speed. Um, machined aluminum spools so all your spools inside here they are machined aluminum uh, versus plastic so that's cool seven millimeter hexes so you can do all your standard wheels and tires that we use for all these minis um, the uh, shocks again are oil filled they are plastic shocks but they have aluminum caps i wish we were able to preload these um, so that kind of sucks that doesn't suck. I mean, they, they feel like this is where they want to be, but I do like adjustability. Uh, so being able to preload them would have been nice. You can always, sh you know, put a little ring in there or try to shim it up or down or whatever, but, or change your spring rates. You know, I'm sure they're going to sell spring rates. Uh, also, we have our adjustable shock mount positions. So that's good. Plenty of 
adjustment there, at least forward and backwards on the front. And then the rear looks like there's one, two there, and then three here. So you can uh, raise the right height there. I'm surprised I didn't put some here. You can always drill new holes though. These are being held in by nuts. They're not threaded. So that's easy enough to just drill a new hole. Just make sure when you, if you do drill your holes, they're exactly symmetric because if they're not, you're going to be sitting like this. Um, they'll be off a little bit and it'll be goofy sitting. All right. We also have the 180 size motor here. So that's going to give you plenty of power. Um, obviously our front tilt body, 2.4 gigahertz radio system, and that 750 milliamp battery um, plus i've got a ton of upgrade parts already for this guy on the red cat site we'll put links down in the description below for everything um, they are affiliate links they do help the channel out we appreciate using those if you're going to buy something it doesn't cost you anything but it does support the channel a little bit uh, more important it tells red cat that we can send viewers their way that way red cat would be more willing to work with us in the future so we look forward to that um but yeah tons of awesome upgrades this guy's going to retail for 119.99 uh, but right now, since it just came out, they're doing like this early bird special, uh, I think through May 1st, 2024. Uh, so basically uh, almost a month. Uh, it's $99, guys. Insane. Insane crawler for $99. Like all the plastic. It's not It's not cheapy. This is like quality Lexan. It seems pretty thick, but not brittle. The plastic is, is quality. Like we have a little bit of flex in our links, but that's okay. It means it means they're going to be not brittle, which is good. Like I'm pushing on this guy and it, it feels rigid yet flexible in just the right spot, like rigid where it needs to be. Our, our chassis is all super rigid. It's not flexing. Oh, this is interesting. I just noticed chassis rails really divert inward. So they're like tucked out. Then you can see they like divert inward. It's hard to tell here. I'll get this as flat as I can, but that's basically flat. So you can see how much they drop in. They go from here to here. Interesting. So you are going to hit your ears on your chassis. Um, but depending on how hardcore you want to modify this guy, maybe you just end up cutting this whole front part of the chassis off. Get a big old servo in there. Then you have no bumpers, at least not on the chassis. Anyway, guys, we'll go ahead and start opening this guy up and show you what it's about. But I think I'm going to go drive it first. Well, you saw it happen. Just a little bit of bind there, kind of pushed it a little bit and it snapped. So we're going to be getting some new links. We did already reach out to Red Cat, let them know, showed them the video and they're sending us a new link or link set. I'm not sure. Um, probably a full link set, but maybe just a link. Who knows? Either way, they're going to send that out. So that'll be good. 
good to know Red Cat's uh, customer service is on point. I saw other people have some other minor issues and they said they reached out and Red Cat took care of them. So super glad to hear about that. Um, one thing I did notice is the body, if you get caught wrong or things of that nature, it just kind of, it pops off more often than I would like. So I was thinking about it, you know, I wish that we showed you earlier how it's this center section here. If the whole front was a solid bumper, it would definitely make it more solid, less flexy, right? Or if they made the uh, little bracket here just a little bit longer or curved it in, it had like a little lip so it kind of snapped in, that would have been kind of ideal. So if they do like an update or revision, just having that have a little snap in it, just a little bit, so it just kind of clips on versus it just being straight slidey. Um, I wonder, I almost wonder if we can maybe melt it a little or heat it up and just kind of, I don't know, don't want to mess it up, but um, having it just a little longer or having a lip would have definitely been helpful because it did pop off probably two times while we were filming that little bit. Um, so yeah, kind of wish it was a little bit more stiff right there. Uh, other than that though, and the, the link obviously, it seemed to perform really well. Um, and we were using this big old battery and all that kind of stuff. So if you were to swap over to a much lighter, smaller battery, I think it would do even better. Um, so definitely excited for this platform. Definitely excited for this truck in general. Um, we do have some other links probably coming, some other minor things that we're going to look at changing over or messing with. Um, I definitely want to get the batteries and ESC on the slider or battery up front. We might do the battery on the sliders and the ESC on the slider just to keep it you know, balanced in the center. Uh, if we put ESC up here and then battery up here, it does raise the center of gravity a little bit because the battery is up a little higher. Um, but then also it could potentially give us weight bias on one side because the ESC is on one side. Or we can move the ESC to right here where the battery tray was. And that'll just kind of keep it all centered. Um, so it, it, you want the forward bias from the battery or you want the lower center of gravity from the battery? I guess that's kind of the question. Um, I think if you're going to add like brass knuckles. So the only thing I'd really add realistically other than, you know, changing your links out. Um, probably brass knuckles for weight and then eventually your servo. Other than that, I think it's going to be golden. All right, let's start opening this guy up. I'm going to take it apart and show you the insides. So your wheel nuts are a five millimeter box. So just know that. Here's our hexes. They're actually pretty wide. And um, I think depending on the type of wheel you use and how much clearance you need, you could definitely narrow in your track width a little bit. Maybe. I don't know. We're pretty close. Uh, but you do have a lot of axle shaft, so that's good. Gives you some options if you do try decide to change your hex width here. Uh, you can go a little wider or a little more narrow. These guys are on there pretty good. There we go. Our little axle shaft pins. Okay. Let's go ahead and open up this knuckle. The hexes are 1.5 driver heads. And the screws are M2s in case you need to screw kit. And there you go. Looks like there was a little bit of grease in there. You can just kind of see the residue. Maybe not. That's probably just machining oil, honestly. Um, so I would definitely grease these guys up. We use this for now. We just use some 2,4-C with PTFE marine grease. And just grease her up. There you are your metal, metal portals there, portal gears, bearings, all that good, good, good. Do these shafts come out through here? Probably not. Go ahead and pull this knuckle off real quick. Show you the, oh, these are hexes too. The top and bottoms are hexes. Phillips heads, that's weird. I don't wonder why they chose to go with Phillips heads on the knuckles. Oh, because they're like kingpin, big fatty kingpin style. Weird. All right. Still think they would have been able to find hex head hardware for that, but maybe not. Oh, you don't even need to pull that pin out. Why is this not coming? Oh, there's screws here. 
All right, so their uh, bearing is kept in with two little screws. And this bearing should be able to pop right out. There we go. All right, so there's your knuckle. There's your CVD. Pretty beefy. The actual axle shaft is three millimeters. The shaft here is also three millimeters. And then, where'd it go? Here we go. Just so you guys know, at the pin, that guy is three and a half. And at the threading, 3.4, or 2.4, excuse me. Okay. Then it steps up to almost three, and then it steps up again where the uh, pin goes through. Just almost three and a half. So your hexes are going to be basically three millimeter. Three millimeter on this side, but then three and a half on this side. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. You could probably just get away with three and a half millimeter hexes. Do we have some? Oh, those are little guys there. Those aren't going to fit. Anyway, all right, so there's our front knuckle. We're going to grease up all of our portals here, um, and then I'm going to show you the diff. When you're putting your axle shaft back into the knuckle, you do have to put it in with the bearing. You can't put the bearing in and then slide this through because it's captured in with the bearing. So just make sure you put your entire axle shaft together and then slide it in the back because it's captured in there so that you can't slide it in this way. Okay. And as with everything in this truck, don't over tighten. You're going into plastic, so you don't really have to tighten it up too much. The screws aren't really going to back out by themselves. Plastic is pretty good at holding screws in for the most part. So just snug them up and um, definitely don't use Loctite unless it's plastic safe Loctite. If you feel like you have an issue, you can always just try to use some CA glue or super glue. Um, it's kind of your best plastic Loctite, realistically. There, There is plastic safe Loctite as well, but... I don't know, we, we've just had good luck with using some good CA glue. You don't use much, just a tad, but only if you've like started to strip out a hole. Just don't over tighten, that's the main thing. Because again, you're going into plastic and it shouldn't, you shouldn't have any issues with it backing out. It's usually only metal into metal that has issues uh, from vibration and stuff that'll cause screws to back out. Okay, so just don't over tighten, don't want to strip things. These guys are tiny. find it kind of interesting there's no bushings in the C-hubs, but I guess that's why they're using these kind of kingpin style screws. Again, these are something you don't want to over tighten because if you over tighten them, they're going to bind up your steering. The rear portal housings are removable, so that's kind of cool. And they do kind of have a, a hex in there, so it's almost like you could clock them, but the problem is there's no other screw holes. And if you did put in new screw holes, um, there's not a lot of meat there to put the screw through. So if you wanted to clock these in some way, uh, it's kind of risky, but you could, I guess. Uh, you could also flip them upside down. We've done that on a crazy build before. But uh, yeah, they're removable just so, you know, if you had any curiosity on whether they came off or not, they do. We're going to go ahead and just remove the whole axle, I think, at this point. Because we got to change this link anyway. So I'll be able to show you better if we just remove the whole axle. remove these shocks you basically just take the top off and then you should be able to just kind of carefully pop the joint out okay we always try to support it from the actual link end not the shock rod, right? The shock shaft, you don't want to bend it from there. You kind of want to try to pull it from the link in. That way it doesn't break or bend anything there. And these guys will just unscrew. Your upper link is held in by a nut. So make sure you 
grab onto that and unscrew. Ta-da! Easy peasy. Our diff cover is held on with just two screws. And there you go. Should be able to drop this guy right out. That's a beefy pinion there. So that's nice. Nice and beefy. Pretty large bearings. And our blocked diff. There's some more Phillips heads, but those are tiny, so we get that. Um, that's cool. I almost wonder if this means they're going to do an open diff version, maybe a monster truck. Just the way these spools are designed, it seems like you could do a monster truck. Now, these are steel. This is plastic. So the, the housing is plastic. But the actual ring here, and the pinion, and the center portion of the spool, all metal. I dig that, though. Pretty cool. So here is a Traxxas ring and pinion. You can compare that to the Red Cat. It's beefier for sure. Just the, um, the teeth alone are much beefier. Look at that. And then even the pinion down in there. Talk about a difference in size. Crazy. So you're definitely going to be a little bit, uh, a little beefier in the Red Cat, I think. We have sheared a few of these guys on the Traxxas. So not only that, with the uh, portals, it's going to probably put less, because you're gearing down, you're going to have less strain on the ring and pinion anyway. So I, these are probably bulletproof. And I'm definitely digging that setup. And again, it'll be super cool if they come out with some uh, open diffs for like go fast builds or monster trucks. That'd be pretty sweet. And these things are oiled up, greased up, but there's not a lot. So again, we're going to add some more just to be sure. One thing, unfortunately, we cannot flip the diff over. If we were to do like a six by six build, your last axle needs the diff flipped over. Um, so unfortunately, we can't do that. We also can't flip the axle over. Uh, I mean, we could, but then we've <laughs> got no place to mount our links. We'd have to do like an aftermarket link mount to put on the bottom and then flip our portal covers, which is good. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, can't reverse that. Or like if you had a reverse drive shaft output to prevent torque twist, not that this has that, but like the FCX has that, or uh, not the FCX, the Hobby Plus, the Hobby Plus and FuraTech trucks have a reverse rotation output shaft. Um, so six by six or reverse rotation, you can't do that with these axles, but that's okay. These are nice and tight. I like how tight they do make the diffs. The housing is is pretty low profile for how big this is, which is is really good. So, helps prevent you from uh, hitting rocks as much. Again, this thing is huge, so definitely beefy, which is awesome. And we're gonna go ahead and just grease this up a little bit. And you don't really want to overdo it. You want just enough to kind of make it lubed, but not so much that it's just like floating in grease. Nice. They're really smooth, by the way. Just want to throw that out there. When you put these shafts back in, make sure you're sitting on the axle shaft pan all the way, or your diff covers will not go on, or your um, portal housing covers will not go on. Give me a little grease in there, too. We almost forgot our bearing. Jeez, make sure you get your bearing in there, guys. I need to pull her back out. So I was like, wait, we missed a bearing. And I want to remind you that as you're putting things back together, tightening these screws down and whatnot, always test along the way. We've only got two screws in right now and we're testing to make sure it doesn't feel tight. If there's any kind of tightness in there, you probably are either over tightened 
or your axle shaft pin and your portal gear here are not fully seated. It can seem like it's fully seated, um, but if you're not careful and it doesn't go all the way on there, you're going to have just a little bit of extra pressure up against your portal housing, and it may even close all the way, but once you start to screw it down, you're going to have a ton of binding. So just check things along the way. Don't put the whole axle together and then find out, oh, it's super tight in there. Why is it so tight? And then you have to go take the whole thing apart to find the issue again. Check it along the way as you go. Everything should be smooth. You don't have to do every screw, but at least do um, every other screw. <laughs> Just kidding. At least, at least check it once a part is put back together, right? So once this portal housing is all together, you can check it. We like to check once we've got two screws in the portal housing just to make sure. Um, but yeah, again, just snug, don't over tighten. And then make sure it's nice and smooth, which we are. And then we can do the other side. Again, make sure you're fully seated. And then you're good to go. Grease. Okay. And screws. And buttery smooth. I'm really digging these axles. Um, they feel really good. I like how beefy they are on this front axle. I really like the, the turn radius you can get out of it. I mean, it's it's got the best turn radius of any of the RTR axles. Like, there's no RTR axle that turns as much as this one does. So, definitely an awesome front axle. Uh, my only complaint is these C-hubs. I don't understand why they dropped the C-hub down so far. They could have easily have brought the C-hub just to right here, right? You don't need all this extra space in here. I guess maybe just enough for the screw. It depends on the screws they're using. Maybe it's hitting on the bearing in there or something, but I don't know. I just feel like they could have minimized this just a little bit in some way because it hangs down really far. Um, that's my only complaint about these axles. Other than that, though, everything on these axles is freaking sweet. Nice and beefy, nice turn radius. Yeah, yeah, digging them, digging them for sure. We went ahead and removed the tray here. It was just a little zip tie, snip that, four screws, pulls the tray right out. Um, it's got a decent amount of weight to it, not a ton. I mean, when you consider that the big batteries in there, it doesn't, it's irrelevant. But if we're getting rid of that uh, battery, might as well get rid of that tray unless we have a reason to keep it. Uh, we're going to move this ESC up to here. And um, yeah, I also wanted to point out the ESC does have the channel three on there. So that's nice, uh, even though the remote has a channel three and a channel four. This combo only has the channel three, but the channel three is on a three position switch. So you can run a rear steer that would be full left, full right or center if you really wanted to, or you could run like a winch that's in, stop and out. Um, or even like a light kit, if you really wanted to plug a light kit in, uh, you could get a light controller box that plugs into there and then run your lights and you can turn them on and off and do whatever the light controller can do through a three position switch. So pretty, pretty cool that it at least comes with that. Kind of wish I had the channel four as well, but not a big deal, it is ready to run. Uh, talking about this receiver in ESC uh, and the transmitter, this is on the same protocol as the V2 axials. So the V2 axial remote will bind to this, as will all of the uh, FlySky smaller remotes. These guys here, as well as the dip switch version and the new FCX 10 remote is on the same protocol. This is an 11 channel remote and obviously it's, uh, it's not gonna, you're not gonna use those channels here, but you can use the channel three, which on here unfortunately is not... Um, or channel three, I don't even remember. It's just a binary on off, so that's not ideal. But, you know, hopefully they'll be coming out with a receiver for this, and then you can use that receiver if you have one of these, or whatever, you'd be able to use the, the receiver for that, for that remote on this guy, and then you would get your channel four. Mind you, it's probably gonna be big, because it's gonna be an 11 channel. I don't know, we'll see what they come out with, but my point is, is all this stuff binds together. You can use all these different remotes to bind to this guy. And the other cool thing is, if you decide to go brushless with this guy, Firatech makes their two-in-one combo, this right here. This is the Lizard Pro combo. They also have a Python Pro combo, and it will bind to all the same transmitters, including this guy here. So you can bind this transmitter to the brushless uh, two-in-one that they offer. They also offer a combo kit for the TRX right now, uh, which has a receiver and the motor and a Lizard Pro, I believe. 
Um, maybe a Python, there might be a Python combo as well, but it comes with the receiver and that receiver, the only way to get that receiver is through Fear Tech and it'll buy into this as well. So you can drop in a brushless system and still use your stock remote straight into this guy. It also, your motor and pinion, from what I've seen so far, you can just put in, it's the same bolt pattern as the TRX4, as well as the pitch on the um, spur and pinion. So you can literally just plug in a TRX4M brushless system from Fear Tech that'll bind straight to your remote here and you don't have to buy a new remote and receiver, although many people have it, but if you're you know, you know newer, this is a great step to that. Even the starter combo that uh, Fear Tech has for the little mini Outrunner Venom, as well as the receiver and um, the ESC Lizard Pro. I think it's like 90 bucks or 100 bucks, drops right in for the TRX4M, bolt right up, and the pinion will match. I think it's an 11 tooth pinion versus a 12 tooth, so you'll actually get a little bit down geared, which is good because you'll get more torque because you got plenty of wheel speed with the brushless. So um, we'll probably do that upgrade in a future video, but I just want to tell you about it now. And again, just let you know this can bind to all the other receivers, all the other transmitters can bind to this, and then this can also bind to the Fear Tech stuff. So that's pretty sweet. Again, just make sure the Fear Tech uh, combo you're getting is not for the Avatar, but instead for the Fly Sky, basically FMS, Hobby Plus, and now Red Cat. Very cool. We got it popped off, just some double-sided sticky tape. I think we're gonna mount it over here, actually on this side, um, just because you have a little bit more clearance from the transmission, that way you're not hanging over your slider. On this side, it looks like it's um, gonna hang out a little bit more. So we're gonna mount it over here, and then we'll put battery over here, and uh, it should be good. Before we get into that though, we're gonna pull out the motor and transmission and show you that. But before we get into that, we're gonna go ahead and just do a shock here. We're gonna open up the shocks, show you what that's about. I do wish they included different spring rates. I really like adjustable shocks where you have preload collar. Um, just because, you know, depending on how you set things up, you just want to be able to do slight adjustments, lower your truck, raise the truck just a little bit in the front or the back, depending on how heavy it is or how you relocate your electronics, stuff like that. Um, so the fact that these are not adjustable at all, I kind of dislike that. Um, hopefully they're going to offer different spring rates. They should have included at least two, a heavier and a softer spring, I think. That would have been super nice or make it adjustable, right? Adjustable preload. These aren't really fatty shocks though. It's 9.8 millimeters in diameter. So definitely, definitely fat. Uh, the length of the shock, full extent, is gonna be right at 52 millimeters probably. Let's see, 51 millimeters. You always go from center eye to center eye. So it looks like 51, 51 and a half, somewhere in there. Between 51 52, okay? I'd say 51 and a half. And then at full compression, well, if you've got your collar on there, or your spring retainer, excuse me, spring retainer is going to make it so they don't compress as much. But it looks like we'll be right around 40 and a half, 40 and a half on that. If you remove the spring retainer and you run no, no springs, which some people love to do. I'm not the biggest fan of that. I like springs because they make your rig controllable, but we'll drop from that down to 37, 38. It's gonna be 38. <clears throat> so a couple millimeters extra uh, to lower your truck if you want if, to completely remove the springs. You can also just move your shocks up on the shock tower, right? That helps as well. Let's go ahead and open this guy. Let's this lower cap open, lower cap should open. See what kind of O-ring situation. It looks like just maybe a single O-ring in there. Some shocks run double O-rings. Some shocks run an O-ring and a bushing or O-ring, bushing, O-ring, just to help prevent leaking. These have a single O-ring. Um, that means they are maybe prone to leaking. Ours were not leaking at all. I did see in one of the Facebook groups, somebody had their shocks leaking right out of the box. There was a little bit of leakage on the cardboard, um, but Tolerance in the cap here is pretty good. So, yeah, I don't know. Let's see what the top looks like here. And these are aluminum caps. There is a bladder, so that's nice. That helps prevent cavitation. Um, so that definitely helps make them super smooth. If you're gonna fill these with more oil or open them up and then take oil out, whatever, uh, we would recommend using this, basically a 20 weight or 195 CST. Um, there's different weights if you want to make them more dampened, less dampened, things of that nature. But yeah, that's kind of the weight we use on most, most of our shocks. 
We really dig it. It's also kind of the weight that a lot of the stock guys use, you know, the manufacturers are using. So if you ever lose oil and you need to replace it, that's a good oil to use. Or go a little thicker, especially if you're if you're not running springs, I would definitely go thicker. But yeah, they, they seem good. For stock shocks, they're good. I wish they were not quite as big diameter, honestly, and I wish they were adjustable, but they feel smooth and that's important. Remember, the whole point of a spring is to keep the traction down, right? So when your axle's articulating over things, the springs help push the axle back down and keep traction on the ground at all times. If you do no springs, you're relying solely on the weight of the axle, which is not ideal. I mean, we do put a lot of weight on our truck, so if you've got a ton of weight, then yeah, you can get away with running no springs. But the point of springs is to make it more smooth and more controllable through its articulation and keeping traction on the ground, right? Because it's pushing it back down. As this one pushes up, the springs are gonna help push this back down. Um, and you also don't want a ton of travel, right? Too much travel or articulation or flex means that as you go over rocks, you will end up dropping down into holes because you have so much articulation and then you just get bound up. So I always say the best crawling is when you're crawling on three wheels because you're floating that third wheel versus dropping it down. Some people think you want four points of contact at all time, right? All four tires, boop, boop, boop. But really you want to be able to float a tire over a gap. If there's some sort of gap or a hole or a ledge, you don't want it to drop down into that and then your whole truck rolls in, right? You want it to float over the ledge. So too much flex will let you drop in. You don't always need contact. You only need three points of contact. Really, you only need two, but the best crawling is on three. So keep that in mind, guys. Just trying to give a little insight there. Now, what works for you works for you, and I'm not trying to say you're doing it wrong, but I just think too much flex is a bad thing, and um, you want your truck controllable. So, But again, if you enjoy it, so that's another thing. If you enjoy it, you like driving it like that, more power to you. I'm all for it. It's kind of like stance in the... Um, in the, the import world, you know, if you're doing real low ride stance, you've got camber out like this. It looks cool. I mean, your, your tire's tucked up in the fender wells. It looks cool. Flex looks really cool, but it does not perform well, right? The camber on those cars, I mean, makes them handle horribly, just like flex. Too much will make you handle horribly. All right, let's go ahead and dive into um, the motor now. Go ahead and pop this out, drop the transmission, open it up for you, show you what it's about. And while we have it out, we probably we're going to short up, shorten up our, uh, our motor wires here. We're going to move this. We don't need all this motor wire. We'll just shorten them up. Super quick and easy solder. And here's the heart. Here's the heart. We're going to have to pull these drive shafts off. And just like that, those four screws come right out. And we'll open it right up. Now that looks nice and greased. That that's a good that's good there. I dig that. So there's the transmission layout. Looks very similar to another one out there. And like I said earlier, the pinion should be a 12 tooth. Yes, it's a 12 tooth pinion, mod four. So again, the TRX 4M uh, upgrade motors and all that kind of stuff should bolt right in here. It's the exact same bolt pattern and the same pinion. Uh, they're gonna be 11 tooth though. So again, you're gonna get more torque, which is actually, in my opinion, a good thing, uh, especially if you're going brushless because you're gonna have enough wheel speed as it is. And then our main spur is 37 tooth. Okay, it's an 1837. And they are labeled, you have an A, B, C, I don't know if you can see it on there. Maybe it says A. This guy says B. And I bet you this one says C somewhere on it. Maybe. Maybe not. It doesn't say C. Either way, this is obvious where this one goes. Let me put this guy back together. The longer or taller uh, spur gear goes on the pinion side. The one with the little spacing on the bottom goes over here. And then your final gear goes like so with your hex so you can see it, okay? Looking like that. Now, these gears are plastic. These are plastic gears. Um, but because they're usually in the transmission and that's not where a lot of the force is, in the TRX, we've never seen issues. So I doubt we're gonna see any issues in here, um, but I'm sure there'll be metal upgrades coming 
all bearings, right? All bearings, so that's good. Like I said, we're plenty greased up, so we're not going to add any grease in there. But yeah, simple as that. Seems good. I'm digging it. I like that it's the same uh, pitch and bolt pattern as other trucks out there, just to make it easier on upgrades. I mean, this is basically a very similar version, if not exact version of the TRX, just a different pinion size. Uh, they probably increased the pinion size because it's being geared down in the portals. That's my guess. So they're able to uh, get more speed through the drivetrain and then into the portals. That way it's not crawling too, too slow. Uh, the gearing in the portals definitely helps though because you got better slow crawl and better high speed than the TRX. So the problem with the TRX, the way it's set up out of the box, is... It's too fast, not enough torque for crawling. And then if you put the crawler gears in it, it's just way too slow to trail with. Like you, you're inching along, right? So this definitely uh, has a little bit better, uh, best of both worlds, essentially. The portals help with that. All right, we're gonna shorten these wires up, I think, because I want to get this nice and clean. We're probably gonna mount this guy right in the middle. We'll give ourselves a little bit of extra length just in case we move it. But I think that's going to be plenty there, right? Like that. So we'll go ahead and make sure they're straight. Nice and equal. And we'll snippy snippy. Always cut off a little more than you think you need because you can always shorten it up if you need to shorten it up, right? But once you cut it, you're not going longer without re-soldering the whole thing or making a new plug. This will be a super easy little changeover. easy to remember, red's got this little red dot right there, so super simple. We need to tin our wires that we cut. So basically you're gonna heat your wire up, and then your solder will go right to it. Really, you should be trying to put the solder on the wire, not on your soldering iron, but whatever, it's gonna work here just fine. And just like that, easy peasy lemon squeezy, guys. It'll be a lot cleaner. And I dig it. And just like that, gotta get our transmission mounted back in. We'll get this double sided sticky taped on. But yes, that helps clean it up a little bit. Also, less uh, wire to travel through for our motor. So, I mean, it doesn't matter much here, but people always say try to go with the shortest wires you can. Uh, helps with response and heating up and stuff like that. Uh, we could do the same with our servo wires here. We could actually open up our servo and unsolder it from in there, or we could just cut it and resolder and fix it. But in this situation, I'm not too worried about it. We'll probably end up switching out our servo at some point. So I'm just going to wrap these up nice and cool it up nice and tight. Uh, and then our battery wire will go right over here. And I think we're golden. Our transmission side drive shaft ends, the male ends are the same length, so it doesn't matter which side it goes on. Also, if you've noticed on this, the uh, drive shafts, we have the female side on the axle side. And there's, there's debates on which is the right way to do it, but I'll explain to you uh, the logic behind both sides. The setup as it is with the female side on the axle is, the argument is that when you're going over rocks, you want the longest section, right? Like this, so that you're not getting caught up um, and, and it's not catching on basically the short end here, getting caught here, right? So you have it on this side and that kind of just makes a smoother transition if you do rub on your uh, rub rocks onto your drive shaft. The argument for going the opposite direction where some people will put the female side over here and the male side over on the axle over here is that they're trying to keep dirt and mud and grime out of the axle shaft, preventing it from basically uh, binding up, right? And so mud trucks and things of that nature, sand run, trucks that run in the sand, um, they're gonna wanna probably run their drive shaft like this, right? Because it, it's gonna help prevent stuff from going up into the shaft. But as you're climbing over rocks, you're definitely gonna hit more, right? You're gonna, you're gonna basically get caught on the edges. Thankfully on these, they're, they're angled, which is nice. They have kind of a chamfer to them. Um, but I think the standard kind of nowadays is running them like this on rock crawlers. That way you're nice and smooth. Another thing is making sure your drive shafts aren't in phase. I'll show you on there, on here, since it's easier. Being in phase means that the ears of your U-joint, see that ear or tab, matches on both sides. So like this, that's in phase, okay? The reason you wanna be in phase is you'll bind less, okay? And at high speeds, you're gonna have less vibration. If you're out of phase, 
like so, where this tab and this tab do not match, you're going to bind more, okay? And you're going to vibrate more at high speeds. You can also tell if you're in phase by basically your screw is facing the same direction on both sides. That'll always, at least every drive shaft I've seen, it'll indicate you're in phase, see? All right, so that's what you want when you put your drive shafts back together, in phase. Less vibration, less binding, especially at high speeds. Looking good. Now we'll just go ahead and wrap this guy up. Make sure it's nice and flat there. And then just basically curl it in. And then I just kind of heat it just a little bit. And tighten it up some more. All right. We usually use a little bit more smaller diameter uh, driver to wrap this around, but I can't find my long one. I don't know where it went. So we're just using this for now. Kind of heat it up again, just getting it a little warm. Nothing crazy. We're not melting it. We're just heating it up and then tighten it up some more. Here we go, looking good. Now, worst case, if we want to use this big old battery, we can, but it's going to definitely weigh down one side over the other. But we're likely going to just use something a little smaller, probably something like this. There's a bunch of different ones you can use, different sizes. Depends on how big you want your battery to be. And you could go down to this one of these little 3S's. It's a tiny little 3S. And that won't take up much space if you want to do that. They also do 2S versions of that. Or a little bit flatter, but longer 2S version. There's just a, there's a lot of different options here. So definitely uh, digging this one. Now we just need a way to mount it. And I like to use rubber bands. And something cool about this little setup here is we can actually pull the... I want to look at this. We haven't opened this up yet. But we can pull these sliders apart, which is kind of neat. Because it also means if you don't want to run the boat sliders, you don't have to run the boat sliders. You can get some more clearance. Mind you, you might hang up a little more, but you have more clearance. So I don't know. It's a trade-off. You can pull these guys off and get all that clearance. So that's an option too, if you want. We're going to run with the boat sliders, but that is an option. Let's see what that looks like with the body real quick. I'm curious. So still, still looks good with the with the body. Again, just gets you more clearance. So it's a good option for sure. Um, but that is how you access all your links. And I just realized when we put our new links on, we're going to have to pull this ESC back off to do that again. Hmm, bummer. All right, we pulled the whole slider off so I can show you this. There are two different spots to mount your links. So that's kind of cool. You can move your links either from the bottom here or you can slide them up to the top. And that'll give you different uh, suspension link geometry angles. So that's cool that straight out of the box stock, you've got some different link mounting options. We really dig that. Um, built into the chassis and the skid and the sliders. So definitely cool that that is uh, adjustable there. I really dig that. Uh, that'll generally help with like your anti-dive or your anti-squat, getting them separated. Uh, separating your lower and upper links more helps your, uh, basically, the geometry for hardcore climbing. Okay. Now, go fast and like off-roading, like, like jumping over bumps and stuff like that. You kind of want your links closer together. Uh, it helps kind of keep the truck more flat, but in crawling, you want to be able to make sure you can push over, right? Like your break over and anti-squat helps with that. And anti-dive is kind of the same. Anyway, we pulled this uh, slider off so that we could put some rubber bands for our battery holder. We have a whole bunch. We have three different sizes of these little guys. We picked them up on Amazon. I can't remember what they're called. Maybe I'll put a link in the description. If somebody really wants to know, you can always comment and I will... Uh, reply to your comment with where where they're at on Amazon. But basically, we're going to go ahead and run our screws back in. I'm just going to put one rubber band here and one in the, the back. And I'll show you why. And our little rubber bands out through here now. And you can just kind of stick your uh, battery in there like so. I use two so that it doesn't cause it to turn, right? Because if you just use one, it kind of pulls it in and goes like that, which isn't a big deal. The body usually holds it in, but I figure you can just do two and it'll hold it nice and straight. And then we're good to go. 
All right, next. We already did it. You might have caught it. We were off camera for a second. I figured, well, I'm changing these screws over and pulling them out to be able to do that. Went ahead and pulled the slider off both sides just because we're probably going to change lengths later. Just makes it easier. Um, I don't want to have to keep pulling this on and off. Eventually, we may put the sliders back on. But these TRX4M links, these are just stock links. I'm using them for now until we get our replacement links. Um, we're probably going to do some upgraded red links. We'll see. These are five millimeters longer than the stock red cat links. So basically these guys come in right at 68 millimeters. A little off there, 68 millimeters. The stock Red Cat links are 63 millimeters. So we're looking at basically a five millimeter stretch in the rear, which might be a little long, might look a little goofy with the body, uh, but I think we're gonna try to run some smaller tires as well so that we can class one this per RCMCCA rules. Uh, we need 57 millimeters. These are 61s, 60s, 61s. We need 57s. So we'll throw some 57s on here. Um, we also, because it's stretched a little, had to move our shock back just a little bit. You can see it, it works just fine. TRX4M links upper and lower. They're the exact same length, upper and lowers. And 68 is what these TRX4M ones are. Uh, and stocks are 63s. So just a little stretch there. The fronts, the lower, the uppers and lowers are the same. The fronts, lowers are 56 millimeters and the uppers are 42. So if you're just looking for links or whatever, you can, you know, find links that are the correct length or close and you can adjust them, especially if they're the metal rod end links and you can just spin them and loosen them and tighten them and just get your adjustments just right, which is kind of what we want to do. Uh, just some, so we can set it just how we want it, just how you uh, have your pinion angle and all that kind of stuff. You know, longer upper links will push your pinion up um, or shorter lower links, however you want to look at it. Anyway, so I just wanted to show that. So we're going to get the wheels and tires and stuff back on there and uh, the body and we'll see how it lines up. It's going to be long. I know that, but I'm okay with that, I think, because again, we're going to class one this guy. Um, it might end up screwing up our bumper. We'll have to see how big our rear tires are. Actually, I just thought about that. Maybe we'll have to extend our bumper just a little bit because your tires have to be um, behind your bumper for class one. So we'll see. Well, there we go. 57 millimeters on there for line trenchers. Stretched out five millimeters in the back. We did check with our little box here. We are hitting on the bumper before we hit the tires. Front and back. Obviously, the front is going to have even more clearance now. Not clearance, but uh, bumper overhang. Less less approach angle, which, again, that's the point. That's why it's class one. It's because they want to make sure that you don't have, like, crazy, crazy approach angles. No bumper, stuff like that. Anyway, so I kinda, I'm kind of digging it. A little stretched, not too crazy. We are not able to completely compress right now. I don't know if you can see that. The uh, screw from the diff housing is actually hitting on the latch right there. Not the latch, but the back part of the latch, kind of. But it's literally just a little bit. So I think I'm just going to trim that out with an X-Acto or a Dremel, and then we should be able to fully compress, or at least get real close to it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking good, looking good. I went ahead and removed the rear tray as well, since we're not using that. Just lightens it up a little bit. I don't think it's going to affect our stiffness at all. When I put this back in here, let me show you. When that's in there though, we're pretty stiff. Like I'm squeezing pretty good there. So I think we're good. Um, you can see, now you can see even better. It's just barely hitting on there. So we're just gonna take this out. This is not super, super important. It's not like it actually holds it here. So I'm not overly worried about that, but we'll just make a little bit of clearance there with the journal and we'll see how it fits. And just like that, we have full compression now. You can see it was just barely, barely hitting on there. Cool. Let's clean it up a little, put it back in. Beautiful. Perfect. Full compression. You can see the shocks and the springs fully, fully compressed. We even have just a little bit of extra space in there. Yeah, buddy. Looking good. Our axles aren't hitting on our chassis rail either. So we could go forward one more and it would drop it just a little lower, but then we would we would be hitting for sure. And we probably would not be able to fully bottom out, but it would be a lot closer um, than it was before. But I think we're good here. I like this. This extra length is definitely gonna help us on our incline. Um, I think when we get our official links, with well, the links we're actually gonna use, we'll probably only end up doing uh, an extra three millimeters over the stock instead of the five that we have here. Um, that, that'll guarantee that we're, we don't have any issues with our bumper and it'll also kind of line up with our body a little better, but it'll give us an extra three millimeters. There we go. Yeah. 
Perfect. Yeah, I'm digging it. These wheels are RC all-wheel drives, and they're they're pretty heavy. They got some good weight on them, so definitely going to help. <laughs> all right, one last thing we want to do here. You can see we laid our shocks all the way back just to get us a little bit lower and give us a little bit more articulation. Um, but our servo is hitting on the chassis rail. See that? So we're not getting full compression. We can under side to side get full compression, but when you're going straight in, that's about it. So we went ahead and trimmed this side of the servo here. Obviously you don't want to go down too far and mess up the mount, um, but you can safely trim off the ear a little bit there and look, much better compression. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do this side as well and should be able to get almost full compression, if not full compression out of that. We'll see if we're actually hitting on the servo horn up on the chassis here or uh, maybe on these little mount bumps. We'll have to see. But let's go ahead and get this guy taken down and we'll give it a look. Went ahead and moved the battery tray because the servo was hitting on these little nubs here. And again, we don't really need it. There's plenty of stability in here. If you feel like you need some stability near your shock towers, you can always just cut the battery tray kind of in half or not battery tray, whatever, this tray in half, and then just kind of put it where you think you need stability. Like you can even use it as part of what holds your shock mounts in. Instead of using the nuts, literally just kind of put one of these air, boom, and screw your um, shock right into the tower here or the tray here. Just cut the tray in half though. That way you can put it in more places without it hitting on things. Anyway, you can see how we trimmed our ears down. We also kind of rounded or angled the servo corners because they were very sharp 90 degree corners. Just took them down just a little bit just because if it hits on the chassis, it's not going to grab as much if they're slightly rounded and they're, that's not going to hurt the servo. Um, we didn't take off much, but now you can see we've got full compression. Boom. Okay. So much better in that regard. Now we have full travel through the shocks. Uh, we're able to sit a little bit lower now, which is nice. We'll probably, when we do the rear links, when we shorten up these links just a little bit, because I want to shorten them by like one or two millimeters, just so that our diff clears this a little better. And then you can see our next hit point will probably be these trusses on the axle. So we might trim those down because they may hit on the chassis just a little bit. Um, once this is able to compress a little more and we'll move the shocks to one more forward position, it'll drop it just a little lower and give us just a little bit more flex. Again, we're not going for the flex as much as we're going for lower in the truck. You can see how it sits and again the rear could be just a tad lower and a tad in we want it longer than stock we just don't want it too long we don't want to rub too bad under articulation otherwise all this work we did is going to be for nothing so this is good though this is good worst case we can always trim our fenders down just a little bit which we might do just to where the black is just take off a little bit here and just get us all the way to the black and that'll get us just a little bit less rubbing but overall pretty clear. So I'm digging that for sure. I like the stance. I think it looks pretty good as far as the stance is concerned. I think we need to uh, go ahead and weigh it next. Yeah, I just need to get the rear just a little lower. Just a little bit. Moving those shocks will do that. So once we get our shorter lengths, they're going to be two millimeters shorter. It should help us not hit on the diff. Went ahead and took the fenders down just a tiniest bit here. Just that little bit of exposed red you can see on this side. It's just a little bit of exposed red. And now we've got just a little bit more clearance. You can see we barely rub. It's under full, full compression to the side. Same in the back. Actually in the back it's a little less compared to this side, which we get a bunch more rubbing. Okay. So just that little bit of trimming. You don't have to trim a ton, just a little bit. You can always take it down more later if you want. But yeah, not even really rubbing there. I mean, compared to what we were. One last little mod before we uh, weigh it. I had an epiphany. I felt like if we put a spacer on the between this and the body, our mount in our body, it would push our body back just a little bit, right, with the spacer, push it back a millimeter or two, and line up our wheel wells a little better in the back, and tighten up our front, because our front, remember, we were having issues with it popping off, 
So we're going to try that. We went ahead and just out of some plastic or styrene or whatever, made this little, little spacer here. Pretty simple. Just used our Lexan scissors and drill bits. It should get us just a little bit of extra space. Should work well. I also went ahead and just barely heated this up with a lighter and like literally just kind of pushed it forward and, and made this little hook. Okay, and you could probably just use like a soldering iron too and you just kind of flattened it. I just kind of flattened it. Well, pushed it forward and flattened it a little bit. But you can see there's like a little bit of a hook there. And now this guy will literally snap on. And it will not come off without some force. So you have to use a lot of force. So let's see. Okay, and it still comes off, but it does hook a little better. And you can, you can hook it even more if you really want it to hook on well. But you combine that with uh, this little spacer to help kind of tighten things up. And it's definitely going to help it stay on. And if you really wanted to, you could even put a spacer on the front here. Just like I said, get some styrene or just some plastic and kind of space it out. Hell, you could even probably use uh, some washers on this just to kind of push this mount this way. And that'll help tighten it up a little bit. I do, again, I wish this was a more solid piece on the front here versus just being this little section here. But eh, it works. All right. So while you can't notice a huge difference, it is just a tiny bit further back. I mean, just because we added a, let's say we had two millimeters there, it's not going to pull it fully two, two millimeters forward, the whole thing back, um, because the body kind of is flexible, right? But what it did do for sure, and you can kind of see here, by the way, it's, it's a little closer to the bumper here, like further back towards the bumper, just a little. But what it did do is it definitely tightened up the front here. So we're a little tighter on that little, I mean, you can still pull it off, but it's it's just a little bit tighter, which is nice. Um, and like I said, it, it just barely moved it back. You can see when I push on it, it just barely moves back. So it's going to be a little more taut pulling this back just a tad. Before it might have been like there. You know, you really can't see a huge difference, but I like that it kind of tightens up the front more than anything. But I think it does, does center it just a little better, just a little bit. Anyway, just a... Take it outside the box mod to try to tighten up the body. Let's weigh this guy. And here we go. 53.47. 53 with a 50-50, which is pretty good. We're only like two grams, maybe almost three grams on the left to right. So yeah, about three, almost four grams. Uh, not a big deal, still 50-50. And then we've got uh, our 53-47 front to rear bias. So could do a little better on the front weight bias for sure. Uh, once we get some brass knuckles or maybe even brass steering links, that'll help that a little bit. One thing too we got to remember is that changing of the electronics is going to have a much greater effect on a truck that doesn't have a lot of weight. These wheels are super heavy in the front and back, so it's going to weigh the whole truck down, which means your percentages are going to lessen, right? It's going to get closer to 50-50 because we put a ton of equal weight in the front and back on these wheels. So um, we're at 505 grams, which is quite a bit. I can weigh it with the stock wheels and tires. Let's go ahead and do that. So right at 391, 390 ish, so about 115 grams difference, and then 55 front, 45 rear versus uh, 53, 47. So 2% difference, but again, these wheels and tires, they are, they're heavy, right? So that's part of the issue um, where it kind of flattens out your distribution. But overall, pretty good. Definitely digging it. Here's the original big old tires. Definitely rubbing with those guys. Um, but yeah, just a little bit of brass in the front. I mean, some brass knuckles or brass steering links or both will definitely forward weight bias. Even a, a high torque servo, that's a metal case servo, will forward bias it a little bit more. So I think we're getting there. Feeling good. And the last little mods we're doing here, we added just a little bit of weight here on the servo. You can see that there. These are wheel weights for like, um, one, you know, full-size cars. They're one uh, quarter ounce each. So that's going to add like 1% to 2% forward weight bias. We also removed some back here. So that's going to help a little bit. We're still going to be at like 56, you know, uh, 56, 44. Um, but it's still better than nothing. And again, we're just trying to do some cheap freebie kind of mods. Um, 
The other thing we're going to do, and I usually talk out against this quite often because it's not ideal if you can get an ideal setup. If you can get the right spring rates and the right shock lengths, you don't need to do this. But this is a fantastic little trick um, if you have these or you can get them real cheap on Amazon, whatever, just some different you know bands. Um, these basically, you can kind of almost tune them depending on how much you stretch them. And once they're stretched to a certain amount, they kind of have that same kind of resistance and they come in three different sizes. Anyway, the point is we just put some bands on here and you can see we don't fully compress because we don't want that. We still want there to be spring. But what this is going to do is going to make our springs act as though they're slightly softer springs, right? So, and it's also going to prevent us from going into full droop. So you can see we still, when I lift this up, that's how much we would droop down normally. We droop all the way down, which means you could unload. And that's where your shock length comes into play. You want to make sure you have not too long of a shock uh, shaft. But this kind of simulates a shorter shock a little bit. Um, while giving us a softer spring that lets us sit a little bit lower. So you can see we're kind of sitting at a little over half droop or half compression. Uh, ideally, in my opinion, you want to be at around 60% compression at your natural weight with your body on and everything. We can go ahead and throw our body on just to kind of show you. Oh, and it's going to be hard to see, but you can still, maybe you can see in there, we still have, we're not fully compressed even with our body on, okay? So, um, being able to get you know 50 to 60 percent compression kind of like you're floating in the middle of your spring that's what you want ideally so these these bands will help with that quite a bit here's the front with no bands you can see we're fully extended because we have pretty stiff springs here um and when i let when i let it drop naturally it's pretty much fully extended which is not what you want not ideally you want it to sit right about there right about halfway right so that way you've still got springs doing their work like i said earlier keeping your traction down but then you also still have some droop so that you can keep traction down when you're um lifting or you know starting to do things and then again to prevent yourself from rolling backwards or unloading too much ideally you'd have just a correct position shock or short enough shock uh to prevent that from happening but these springs are going to or these bands are kind of going to do both where we get a little bit of kind of a softer spring rate sort of uh, but then also prevent unloading. So it's simulating a little bit shorter shock, a little bit softer spring. Okay. And again, it's super cheap. You can do it, um, you know, with no, no money really. Um, it's not an upgrade part per se, and you may not be able to find those perfect shocks. So I am okay with tuning your springs and shocks with bands, so long as it's consistent, right? Like it keeps your truck consistent and you're understanding the principles behind why it's working and how it's actually a band-aid. It's really a band-aid. It's not the proper way to do it. I'll put it in quotes, proper way, but I'll tell you what, it's like a 95% of the way there for what you're trying to achieve without having to buy new shocks, right? Or new springs. So again, as long as you're not too tight on your bands, right? Like you've noticed, we've, we've got them just about perfect. If these were comp compressing all the way, I wouldn't do it because I don't want the bands to be sucking my axle in. That defeats the purpose of the springs or the shocks altogether, right? You don't want it just sucking it in. You want to have compression. You want to have movement in your shock and spring. You want to be able to unload a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit. And you want to be able to compress a little bit. So again, about 60, 40 or 50, 50. The last little thing we did because we've gotten this guy kind of so low and it's tucking all the way up in, right? See that? We're our servo is going way into the chassis rails. We were having issues with our drag link here, kind of hitting on these mounts, okay? So what I went ahead and did was I simply took the servo horn and I milled it down, dremeled it down just a little bit. You could probably even use an X-Acto and just kind of cut it down. Now it does thin it out, uh, so we could end up breaking there, but don't thin it out too much. We actually went a little more than we needed to, but because you can see there's plenty of clearance now. When I fully compress, we have plenty of clearance. We could have been a little bit thicker there and it would have been fine, but basically just take that down just a little bit. It'll slide your drag link back in, which actually gives you better geometry here anyway. And then, uh, yeah, you should be good to go. Your screw will po poke out the back a little. And again, you don't want to narrow this up so much that your screw goes so deep that it rubs on the diff cover, but you can see we got a we had a little bit of rubbish there, but we just ran it a little bit and it basically, you know, took itself. It, gave itself a little groove but you can avoid that because like i said we got plenty of room in there so you're able to take off just a little bit test fit it make sure you're not rubbing and then you you know if you barely have a millimeter of space there then you're gonna have plenty of room behind it and you won't hit on the uh the diff cover at all with the screw so we just took off too much didn't follow our own rule and didn't test fit as often as we should have I basically test fit the first one i was like yeah we need to do a lot more and i went a lot more and i went too much but that's okay so Everything is nice and smooth up here now. We got plenty of, of room in here. One thing I want to point out about aftermarket servos too, while we're in here talking about it, uh, almost all the aftermarket servos have exit wires to the side, which if you start doing stuff like this, your wires are going to likely hit or rub on your shocks, things of that nature. Um, so 
and you have to run the wire on the outside if it goes out the side of the, the shock. One of the few servos out there that exists is a three flow nine servo and it's a side or a rear exit wire. So it comes out the back just like this stock servo, which is pretty cool. And the servo horn, the stock servo horn will slap right on there. They do have an awesome stainless steel servo horn, but it's M2 hardware uh, or M1.5 hardware. And this is M2. So this screw is gonna be a little too big. If you do aftermarket links uh, and you do a 1.5, you can screw it into the stainless steel three flow nine uh, torrent servo horn. But yeah, the torrent is one of the few servos that exits out the rear, which is what we're going to put in this guy more than likely uh, once it's time to upgrade. Okay, and there'll be a video on that when we do it. So definitely make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you know when the, that video goes up as well, guys. Okay, I think, I think we're good here.
All right, the wind's picking up. <laughs> Dropped our phone in the snow. We're heading, we're heading back down. It is freezing and windy and deep. The snow is deep. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll talk to you more when we get home. This thing's freaking sweet. And there we have it. I hope you enjoyed the video of this guy. I know it was a long one, but we wanted to show you everything. And uh, yeah, get you some kind of fun running footage. Uh, it was freezing out there and some pretty deep snow. It literally snowed like 18 to 24 inches just the day before. And I was over in that way and I was like, mm, maybe we should just stop by and just see if we could get up there. And we made our way up. But yeah, this thing is awesome. It's been super fun. Um, I mean, at the price point, guys, this thing is insane. It's just, it's, I can't believe that they're able to release this for such a good price point, right? And even at 120, if you're watching this video now and it's the price has gone up to 120, don't feel bad. It's still a killer deal. Um, just some minor modifications really kind of makes this thing a performer. We also drove it, um, at our local, uh, we have kind of a summer comp series. And so I'll have a video on that. I'll probably post it somewhere, but, um, we drove it a little bit in that and uh, it did really well because I know some of the crawl footage up at uh, Red Rocks did not really show its capability as much, but I wanted to say that it crawled really well. Like I said, some of that crawler footage from our uh, season opener event this month, uh, it did pretty good. It was pretty cool. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely check this out if you're looking for something. If you're a veteran crawler, been around for a while. Um, you know the value that's here. And if you're a newer person, this is a great first truck. It is a fantastic first truck. Again, just a couple really cheap and free mods makes it way capable. So that's pretty awesome. And just out of the box, even without any of that stuff, it's damn good. But we always add a little bit of weight. I, you know, I wish more companies would try to get that 60-40 weight bias out of the out of the box. But again, they got to sell parts, so that's understandable. Also, you know, when you start adding metal, like brass diff covers, um, brass knuckles, stuff like that out of the box. It just raises the price exponentially. Um, so th they want to get you something to start with and starting with it, even with no mods, you will have a blast. So um, definitely worth checking out guys. Uh, again, we, we, we bought this truck the day we saw it. Um, we were lucky that they shipped it pretty quickly. And so we're super stoked um, that we were able to show you guys this thing. Anyway, the video is long enough already. I want to say thank you to everybody that's been watching. We have tons of reviews on our channel. We got tons more coming. It's really hard to keep up, but we're trying to do it for you. And um, yeah, there's going to be a lot more coming and we're going to have some more Red Cat stuff coming. And they actually reached out to us, which was freaking awesome because we have a Facebook group for this guy. Uh, so definitely check out the Facebook group for the Red Cat Ascent 18. We'll put it down in the description below. And uh, why don't you comment down below? The Red Cat Ascent can descend because it descends really well too. So we'll put that down in the comments below if you made it this far. That way I know you watched the whole video. Again, thanks a ton, everybody. We have channel members. If you want to support the channel through channel members, um, you get to see videos early with no ads. You get priority comments, a whole bunch of cool perks. Check out our channel members. We also have swag. Tech, check out our swag. We don't make any money on it. Maybe a dollar here or there just because we have to buffer their price changes. But uh, just it helps support the channel just uh, by promoting. And uh, yeah, get out there, build something awesome. Build a car, build a course, build a community, and then race, crawl, and bash or smash it, crash it, and bash it. But don't break the expensive parts. Take care, everybody.